First scholar, when, welcome to today's meeting on the Bush administration and Middle East peacemaking the final six months. We are really uh, privileged to have uh, three very distinguished speakers with us today. Um, Rami Khouri, David Makovsky, and Aaron David uh, Miller. Um, we will uh, hear a 15 to 20 minute presentation by Rami, followed by 15 minutes by uh, David, and 10 or 15 minutes or whatever by Aaron David uh, Miller. Uh, could I kindly remind you to close your cell phones because it interferes with our sound system in this room. There is an overflow on the sixth floor in the boardroom and we will take also their questions in uh, writing. Mm. We will take uh, comments and questions from the floor and we also will ask our speakers to discuss the different issues among themselves. So, uh, to my right, David Makovsky is the director of the project on the Middle East peace process at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, he's also an adjunct lecturer in Middle Eastern Studies at Johns Hopkins University, Paul Echnitzer School of Advanced International Studies at SAIS. Before joining the Washington Institute, uh, David was an award-winning journalist who covered the peace process from 1989 to 2000. He's the former executive editor of the Jerusalem Post and was diplomatic correspondent for Israel leading daily Haaretz. Uh, he's now a contributing editor to U.S. News and World Report and he served previously for 11 years as the magazine's special Jerusalem <coughs> correspondent. In 1994, he was awarded the National Press Club Edwin M. Hood Award for Diplomatic Correspondence, and he's the author of a number of books and uh, articles. To my left, Rami Khouri is currently a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and he's the first director of the Assam Forest Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University in Beirut, AUB. He's also a syndicated political columnist, he's a book author, the editor at large, and former executive editor of Beirut based The Daily Star. He teaches at, annually at AUB, the University of Chicago, and Northeastern University, and he serves as a non resident senior fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at uh, Harvard, and many other affiliation. I'm going <laughs> to skip that. In 2006, he was awarded the Pax Christie International Peace uh, Prize, and we are delighted to have him with us at the center. Aaron David Miller, a colleague and good friend, is currently a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center and is the author of the book America and the Much Too Promised Land, The Elusive Search for Arab-Israeli Peace. It's a wonderful book for those of you, this is not part of the script, but for those of you who have not read the book, I really recommend that you should go and get it and read it. Between 2003 and 2006, he served as president of Seeds of Peace, a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering young leaders from regions of conflict by providing them with the leadership skills required to advance coexistence and reconciliation. For the previous two decades, he served as an advisor to six secretaries of state, helping formulate U.S. policy on the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli peace process. He served as the deputy special Middle East coordinator for Arab-Israeli negotiation, 
a senior member of the State Department policy planning staff, and he has received the Department's Distinguished Superior and Meritorious Honor Award. He is the author of three books on the Middle East and has lectured widely on this subject. We start with Rami. Uh, you go first, followed by David and then by Aaron David Miller. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Harley, uh, and thank you all for coming. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to be here at the center. To on, uh, Unfortunately, it's only two months, but uh, it's a wonderful experience, and I'm <clears throat> thoroughly enjoying it, especially getting to know Washington better, which is, um, in terms of somebody who's interested in Middle East politics, is always a mixed, uh, a mixed blessing. But uh, you've got to know all sides in this situation, so it's a real pleasure to be here and get to know more of um, the people and the institutions and the sentiments here in Washington. I'm very pleased to be on this panel with David and, and Aaron, um, to close friends and the people I respect very much. Um, we often agree and often disagree, but we always try to do it in a civil and um, enjoyable way, and uh, we learn from each other, and I think this is uh, one of the strengths of certainly American culture and certainly the Wilson Center. <clears throat> so it's really um, a great uh, pleasure for me to do this and share my thoughts with you about what we are um, <clears throat> looking at in terms of the next, uh, the last six months of the Bush administration. Um, in terms of Arab-Israeli peacemaking or peacemaking in general in the Middle East. The uh, situation really is uh, one in which we are, I think, on the verge of potentially historic changes. Um, when you look at the Middle East uh, and the Arab-Israeli situation, the U.S. involvement with the Middle East in general, and you look at the last six months of the Bush administration, I think you really have to obviously put it in the context of what's come before and, and what's come before has been seven years of um, very dramatic changes in terms of both American policy in the Middle East and in terms of the situation in the Middle East itself. And I think one of the basic questions that we have to ask, not only about the next six months, but for the many years to come, um, is the following. Are we going to analyze the Middle East primarily from the perspective of American and or American slash Israeli interests, or are we going to perhaps for the first time in modern history analyze the Middle East in terms of the legitimate concerns, rights, and fears of the Americans, the Israelis, the Arabs, the Turks, and the Iranians? Are we going to take a integrated, holistic, and um, humanely sustainable view of all of the people who are involved in this region. In other words, are we going to, at the beginning of the 21st century, break that colonial and neo-colonial and now neo-conservative neo-colonial pattern that has predominantly defined the American perspective on an engagement with the Middle East for the last uh, uh, four, four or five decades or so? Are we going to, in the early 21st century, break uh, the neo-colonial pattern uh, and not repeat the same mistakes that the European colonial powers made when they retreated slowly from the Middle East starting in the early 20th century? A century later, we can see some um, vague but, but some similarities, I think, between the Middle East and its interaction with Western powers a hundred years ago when it was the Europeans who were slowly pulling out, ending the, at the after World War I, and the situation today with the United States as the dominant Western power that's engaged in the Middle East and is looking to perhaps reassess its policy, certainly because of Iraq, but possibly because of other, other issues as well. I think if you look at the coming six months, and you ask, well, when we talk about peacemaking, we're talking about Arab-Israeli issues, but we're also talking about wider issues uh, of peacemaking, because the, the two most powerful changes, I think, that have happened in the Middle East in the last probably 15 years, I would say, but it's been most obvious since 9-11 and beyond, the two most powerful changes um, are the ones that will 
help us answer this question. The first is that this is a region that used to be defined heavily by one conflict, which was the Arab-Israeli conflict. You had a bunch of little proxy wars here and there, and, but it was really a one issue, a one conflict region, the Arab-Israeli conflict from the 50s and, uh, and, until um, recently. The Cold War provided an overlay of that, but it really was linked in many ways. The Arab-Israeli and the Cold War tensions were formed one dynamic in the region. Um, now you have a region that's defined by many conflicts and tensions ideological conflicts, military conflicts, religious conflicts, cultural wars, uh, social uh, issues, economic issues, the whole range of very active conflicts in the region. You look at Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Sudan, Somalia, uh, Yemen, um, Algeria a little bit. You, anywhere you look in the region, um, the Turks and the Kurds, you find a whole range of active conflicts uh, which make this region much more complicated. And in this uh, proliferation of conflicts, there is a certain um, integrity, uh, no, not integrity, but certain integration, commonality among these conflicts, um, making this the first time, I think, in my adult life where I see the Middle East region actually act, acting as a region in the sense that because of this widespread proliferation of conflicts, you have a lot of people and some governments in the Middle East, especially the Arab Islamic Middle East, um, working together in a somewhat coordinated ideological process, which is defined primarily by resistance to American policy, Israeli policy, and the policies of some of the prevailing uh, dominant Arab uh, governments and regimes. Um, so you get the situation broadly around the Middle East today where you see Muslim Brotherhood groups, Islamist groups, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Syrian government, the Iranian government, some tribal groups, some democracy, some Arab nationalist groups, a whole range of very different kinds of uh, people and movements and, and political forces um, finding themselves allied together in, in one group. Um, and so you see the Middle East region at one level acting as a region rather than as a bunch of isolated states and movements. And on the other side, you find confronting this also a broad coalition of groups, governments, movements, individuals, political forces that are um, close to the U.S., close to Israel in some cases, not all, um, allied to some of the dominant Arab governments. Um, and this defines the, the region um, as we know it today. So this, this is one change. The other big change is that the group that I defined that probably represents over half the people of the Arab Islamic region, Turkey, Iran, um, um, the Arab countries, I would say over half the people at the level of public opinion is critical of United States policy and critical of Israeli policy. And the, what makes the different today is that they are no longer docile. They are actually active politically uh, in various ways, um, in democratic movements, in resistance movements, in opposition movements, uh, at the rhetorical level, uh, just speaking out in, 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 men, in many different ways. But you have a, a force of defiance and resistance that defines much of the Middle East today, which wasn't, which wasn't there before. Um, so you have a completely different situation as the nature of American involvement in the Middle East has changed dramatically in recent years with military involvement, regime change, the neoconservative zealotry um, driving much of the American policy. You've had a completely different um, or much more heightened American direct military and politically predatory uh, participation in the, in the Middle East, involvement in the Middle East, which has generated this counter-reaction where there are a lot of different people are actually n no longer afraid of resisting or challenging the United States. Um, th and there's many reasons for this. I don't, we don't have time to go into them right now, but this is part of a historical process that you can trace back to the 1967 war, uh, the overthrow of the Shah, um, the end of the Cold War, um, 
the Iraq War, uh, 9-11, then the uh, Iraq uh, War, and then finally the Israeli-Hezbollah War in 2006. The consequence of these major uh, milestones, um, <clears throat> I think, is that you have a completely different uh, balance of power and a kind of calculus of power um, in the region. And this is something that the United States has to look at in terms of what it's going to do in its uh, last six months of the Bush administration. Um, within this changing environment of many conflicts and many people in the region standing up to the U.S. and Israel and, and conservative Arab regimes, uh, there's a standoff, there's a kind of a stalemate. Uh, the, these are two powerful forces on both sides. It's, it's not a situation where one side has won and one side has lost. The, the, the two broad forces that we see in the region are actively fighting each other in various local conflicts in Palestine and um, in Lebanon and, and different places. And they've more or less fought each other to a stalemate at the political and the military and the ideological um, level. But when you look at the region and then you look again at Arab-Israeli peacemaking, I would argue that the Arab-Israeli conflict remains the most the single most powerful force for radicalization um, and the political turbulence in, in the region. I think if you trace it historically, the continuation of the Arab Israeli conflict, the lack of a just and fair negotiated resolution, um, the persistence of Israeli settlement and colonization policies, and the increasingly pro-Israeli American government position, which has been very obvious with this Bush administration, that trend has triggered an increasing willingness to resist and to fight back um, in the region and has triggered an increased technical proficiency to do so. And if you look at the performance of Hezbollah in Lebanon, if you look at the performance of Hamas in Palestine, uh, Hamas has now forced Israel into the third ceasefire that Israel has done with Hamas in the last three years. And this is an extraordinary uh, comment on the changing uh, geostrategic landscape, that Israel has to make a ceasefire with Hamas. Um, and Israel is right to do that. I think this is w one of the few times where I think Israel is acting sensibly. Um, and the United States, interestingly enough, finds itself rather marginalized in this process. And if you look at the region today, there are about six major mediation efforts uh, in which the United States is either totally uninvolved or uh, only in an indirect behind-the-scenes way, where you have the Israel-Hamas negotiation led by Egypt, you have the Israel-Syria negotiations handled by Turkey, you have the uh, intra-Lebanese negotiations handled by Qatar, you have the hamas fatah negotiations handled by the Saudis, you have the Syrian-Lebanese negotiations handled by the, um, uh, by the Arab League. Um, and all of these uh, conflicts and all of these mediations in the region are now mediated by parties uh, other than the United States, which I think is also a good thing, probably, because the United States has proved itself not to be a fair and impartial mediator in the Arab-Israeli conflict. It has lost a lot of its diplomatic credibility, and the region doesn't want to have perpetual warfare, so other people have stepped in to try to play a reasonable uh, mediating role. Um, so I think the U.S., uh, as we look at the last six months, the question become, will this administration leave behind a situation where the next American administration in combination with the Europeans and the Russians, ideally, would be able to address this new strategic balance of power, this new reality in the region, and try to come up with a negotiated resolution to the various conflicts that is sustainable and acceptable to all because it does take into consideration the rights and the interests of all the parties. Or will the U.S. administration in its last six months persist in its ideological zealotry and its bias and continue to try to fight Islamist groups that are the most widespread political groups in the region and continue to almost blindly support 
Israeli positions, including colonization um, of the West Bank and, um, and Golan? And will the U.S. simply keep pushing the region into more uh, confrontations, particularly with Iran, uh, which make it almost impossible uh, to see a peaceful transition of this region from one in which there are increasing numbers of conflicts and more violent conflicts uh, to one in which people actually try to sit down and start negotiating uh, resolutions to these conflicts. I think the fascinating situation now where Israel has been recently simultaneously negotiating with Hezbollah, Syria, and Hamas is an extraordinarily dramatic new symbol. Uh, we don't know how deep this is. We don't, uh, we don't know how serious it is. My sense is it's actually a really telling symbol of the changes that are taking place in the region that the Israelis understand much better than the people here in Washington. Uh, whether it's because they're, the Israelis are able actually to manage their own Middle East policy in a way that the American administration often is not, um, or whether it's simply that the Israelis are much more realistic about the realities in the region, that Hamas and Hezbollah are not just a new manifestation of al-Qaeda, as some of the neoconservative zealots think it is. Um, I, whatever the reason is, the Israelis are doing absolutely the right thing to negotiate with these groups and countries and, and movements to try to find a balanced resolution of some of their um, conflicts. The, the, um, the wider issues in the region um, are ones that are directly impacted by the continuation of the Arab-Israeli conflict. So I would say that the resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict, to me, remains the most significant short-term, immediate process that can be initiated. Um, the U.S. government, with the Annapolis uh, process, showed that it wasn't very serious about Arab-Israeli peacemaking, at least from what we know. There may be all kinds of secret stuff uh, going on, but you're dealing with a, um, a level of either insincerity or incompetence that is really almost unprecedented in big power involvement uh, in the Middle East. Um, um, a level of incompetence that um, uh, is very strange because this is not an incompetent nation. The United States is a very serious, a very big power, uh, and has major consequences that come out of its policies. Um, but what it has done so far in the Annapolis uh, situation has been very disappointing. Um, and you're dealing with um, three leaders, George Bush, Ehud Olmert, and Mahmoud Abbas, um, who have uh, very, very low credibility with their own people and, and almost zero ability to bring about significant new change um, in the region. And their people understand that. Uh, these are very uh, thin, um, they have very thin credibility on the ground and therefore it's not realistic to expect anything to happen um, in the next six months. So I think the best that we can expect is kind of to, to prevent any further deterioration from uh, coming about because of American zealotry and, and, and militarism, um, and to leave the region in a situation where the new emerging diplomatic forces and the forces of realism uh, in the region itself can perhaps try to find uh, an accommodation amongst, um, amongst themselves. I just end by saying that to understand the dynamics that define the wider Middle East, the, the whole region, not just the Arabs and the Israelis, but you take the Turks and the Iranians and others. I think there's really four big issues that the Europeans at the end of World War I really, they blew it. They did a very bad job in addressing these issues, which is why we've had a century of conflict and tension and violence that has sucked in the Americans and, and the Europeans to an extent with their armies and turned the region into a region of tremendous uh, chronic violence now that is practiced by all the, all the major players. All the governments routinely use violence, the Israelis, the Arabs, the Turks, the Iranians. They use violence against their own people. They use violence against others. The foreign armies that are there, and the, the Americans, the British, and others, the violence is now is, is the political violence is the routine, everyday language of political expression. Um, this has been going, getting worse in the last 100 years. So if you want to avoid the mistakes that the Europeans did, 
uh, I think we need to understand that there's probably four uh, big issues that define the people of the Middle East. And if we, if we want stability, if we want peacemaking, we need to address the issues of the nature of sovereignty, that these are societies where people feel they must have real sovereignty. They must be in control of their destiny, their land, their people, their ideology, etc. Uh, the second one is the validity of indigenous identities. These, this is a region where more and more people feel frustrated that they cannot express themselves ideologically, politically, culturally, nationally, religiously in any way they want. Um, and the big change, as I said, in the last 15, 20 years is people are taking command of their own societies and organizing and expressing themselves and, and not being docile and silent anymore. They're challenging the Americans, the Israelis, the Arab governments, whoever it is that uh, they feel worried about. Um, so this expression of indigenous identities is critical if we want stable situations. The third one is the legitimacy of power and authority. We're dealing with a lot of powerful forces whose whose power is very significant. If you look at the Egyptian government, you look at many Arab governments, you look at the Israeli government, the American government, they have tremendous power in the region. But they're, they're, the legitimacy of that power and how they use it is decreasing. And you have many Arab governments that are very powerful, but their power doesn't extend to their entire societies anymore. They're increasingly limited in where they can actually impact on their societies. And the fourth one is the viability of state configurations. I think we still have a problem in this region, which goes back to much of what the Europeans did as they left, um, with the viability of state configurations. Some of these countries don't make a lot of sense. Um, they need to be reconfigured, uh, but only by their own people. We need to have a situation where the people of the region um, and this applies to most of the countries of the region, Turkey, Israel, Iran, the Arabs, almost all of them have structural problems of national identity and state configuration. And these need to be addressed by themselves, not by foreign, uh, foreign powers. So the last six months of the Bush administration in terms of peacemaking in the Middle East, I would say, is to understand the nature of the conflicts and tensions that define the region, understand that people in the region are no longer docile and acquiescent in a, in a neo-colonial, neo-conservative um, political order, are fighting back, have fought the U.S. and Israel and the Arab regimes to a draw in many cases, and are prepared to, to keep fighting if they have to, um, and to understand that there is a better way out of this, that the people of the region also are r addressing legitimate grievances in most cases that need a political um, resolution. And the United States is ideally placed, uh, if it wishes, to, to play the role of an actual uh, impartial power that engages with people all over the region in a peaceful resolution of these conflicts. So that's a hopeful um, scenario. It's unlikely to happen under this administration, um, but it, it can happen uh, under the next administration, perhaps. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Rami. David. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, um, Hala, for hosting us, and for Rami and Aaron and being on this panel. As Rami said, I think uh, the three of us um, have mutual respect, so it's good to be on the same panel with two friends. Um, I, I, I'm going to do this maybe a little a bit differently in the sense that I just thought I would like to address Rami's uh, point um, that I think predominate his remarks towards the end, but begin more with an update as I see uh, kind of the different uh, hot spots on uh, Middle East peacemaking and, and uh, the role of the United States in the last six months. Um, I would say if we just look at Let's start with Gaza. Rami mentioned it. Uh, how, what, what sort of a chance do we see that there could be a ceasefire? By the way, I should preface this remark by saying there's a, there's a history uh, uh, in 1988 and in 2000 were the ends of two administrations um, where you saw a dramatic move by the United States. In the case in 1988, uh, you had the U.S. PLO dialogue started uh, during this twilight zone, I call it, between after an election and before an inauguration. And the Clinton parameters in the year 2000 were also done during the same period, which was an effort to kind of define an American position on the end of Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In 1992 was the third time that there had been this change of administrations. There was also a, a development which uh, wasn't taken by the United States, but uh, 
also kind of fit into this twilight zone. So it's unclear to me if, you know, are we going to be, is that going to happen again in 2008? 96 and 2004, there was no handover because there were two terms of Clinton. Two, and 2004 was uh, started the second term of Bush. Um, so I would say the following. Um, I'll, I'll get back to that point. But the, uh, if we look at kind of where the different hot spots are, the Gaza ceasefire, how long will it hold, and why is Israel doing this? Um, I, I think what it will turn on really is what Hamas does, uh, less than what Israel does. If Hamas uses the ceasefire to rearm, uh, there's like 40 tunnels uh, from in this 10-mile zone. Uh, it's known as the Philadelphia Corridor, uh, straddling Egypt and Gaza. If they use the ceasefire as a time for rearmament, I don't think this ceasefire will last. I think the, the support in Israel will evaporate and saying, hey, you know, this is a ruse, this is not sincere. The other element will be, some say there's up to 11 factions, I think, most notably the Islamic Jihad, uh, you know, which gets sizable Iranian backing, Hamas does too, but Islamic Jihad, I think, is, is more a, a subsidiary of Iran. Um, is Hamas going to impose its discipline on these factions from hitting Israel? Uh, Haniya said something the other day. There have been statements saying they will not impose. On the other hand, there have been some statements saying, well, that this is not the time to hit Israel. It will be interesting if, if Hamas is able to articulate a rationale of not to engage in attacks, then I do think uh, this could, have, uh, could hold. But how Hamas reacts on the issues of rearmament and on the issues of imposing its discipline on these other actors, I think will be crucial. I think Hamas may invoke, if it wants to, which is the economic situation, and saying uh, this is, you know, this is good for the Palestinian people. We're, you know, we we're the ones really wanting this ceasefire because we want to consolidate our authority. Uh, they might not say it that way. We want to show we could govern. But it, it's clear they have a, a real interest in, in keeping it. But let's see if they're able to impose their discipline. It's something they have not done in the past. So I think the ceasefire it, uh, uh, depends on their actions. Why Israel would be interested? Well, I think Israel look, wanted to get out of Gaza in 2005. They felt that they're the ones who have done the heavy lifting. They pulled out 8,000 settlers. Uh, and all they got were rockets, that there have been 2,500 rocket uh, uh, attacks since Hamas came to power in early 2006. And they would say no country would, 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 would put up with this, and they have held their tongue. Uh, it could be that Olmert is trying to cool off a variety of fronts. Uh, if he wants some sort of breakthrough with the Palestinians, which I'll get to in a second, or if he wants to focus energies on the Iranian issue. Um, so is there any hope for a breakthrough on the, on the West Bank uh, with, with the Palestinian leadership? You know, when I was in Israel last month and I spoke to, you know, a lot of people, including several cabinet ministers, I felt this was the strategy all along was to wait until the Knesset went into recess in August and to try to use that time for a breakthrough. Um, you know, people say, well, Omer is so weak, you know, and, and Abbas is weak, and Bush is weak, and what are the chances? It could be that uh, Rice and, and Omer are basically have an, aligned in the sense that uh, Rice is coming towards the end of her tenure here. <coughs> Omer seems that he's be facing a primary challenge at the end of September in the Kadima party. Clearly, the only thing he would have to go for, going for him, would be a peace breakthrough. If it's seen, though, as a desperate move to save himself and that it's a bad deal, it'll hurt him. So, but I, you know, it, you know, you can never, no one's ever gone broke being pessimistic about the Middle East. That's kind of an iron law. So uh, it, it's hard for me to sound too optimistic here. But I do think that, um, that there is, there are, that, that Omer's going to try to make this effort. Yeah, that's all you have to say, he'll fail. But my sense is on when it comes to land and on refugees, the differences in the talks are much narrower than the people in this room would suspect. So I don't think we're talking about big differences at this point. There, you know, Jerusalem security, there are some big issues out there. There are formulas to address some of these questions. So it's hard to be too optimistic. Um, will the U.S. put forward a bridging proposal uh, to deal with these differences? Right now, I think 
what's best is when the parties can deal with the problems by themselves. If a, a bridge is needed, I would say you could always bridge over a pond, but you can't bridge over an ocean. If the differences are too wide, a U.S. bridging proposal won't make a difference. I tend to think that Olmert and Abbas respect each other. Uh, there has never been a time since Madrid in, in 1991 that the leaders on both sides actually believe the other side wants peace. I mean, I don't mean to ruin anybody's day in this room or in the overflow room, because uh, everyone is so much expects bad news in the Middle East. If you tell them a little bit of good news, they don't know how to process it. Uh, but I would argue what's what's good here is that that you didn't have this, you didn't have it during Sharon's time, Arafat's time. There was no sense the other guy was genuine, and here there is that sense. And B, they've spent more time actually thrashing out these what we call final status issues than at any other time. Uh, more than they did certainly at the end of the Clinton administration where there was this effort to, to try to make it happen. So I don't think, it, I wouldn't rule it as impossible and I think that Omar and Rice certainly would like to see it happen if, if it's doable. And I think Abbas knows that the alternative for him of, um, is not the Hadassah women of Brooklyn, it's Hamas. And, uh, and in, their, in that view, I think that, that all these leaders seem to me would have an interest in trying to make it happen. But if it can happen, then I would hope it should at least be an orderly handoff to a new administration so we don't have the same disruption, uh, to put it mildly, that we had the last time at the end of 2000 um, with, the, with the blow up of an intifada. Um, I would like to make a point on the Israel-Syria talks. I tend to believe, and this is why I, I don't think I fully share Rami's um, optimism about the role of Turkey. I think it's great that Turkey is doing what it's doing and that Israelis and, and Syrians are meeting in hotel rooms or not exactly meeting, having indirect talks. Uh, but it seems to me these talks are not going to get anywhere in 2008. This seems to be a classic 2009 issue because if you look at certainly from where the Israeli uh, military establishment is standing, their whole interest in the Syria talk is to peel them away militarily. I'm not talking about economically. I mean, Turks have relations with Iran, other countries have good relations, but the whole idea is to see if you can get them away from their alliance, that, that they're not a conduit for, for missiles and rockets to Hezbollah. Um, and for that, if you were Bashar Assad, you'd say, yeah, okay, you want me to jump to another swimming pool? I got to know there's water in the pool. Uh, and without water in the pool, you can't expect me to go in that other pool. And I tend to believe that requires two, two countries who could fill up that pool, and that is the United States and Saudi Arabia. And I think without those, that sort of uh, involvement, I don't think you will see anything big here. I mean, it took uh, Henry Kissinger in the 70s, he had a, someone like Sadat, where Egypt switched sides, so to speak, from the Soviet orbit to the uh, American one. Here, it seems to me, Syria is not always even in the Arab orbit because it, in the Iran-Iraq war, going back to 1980, it was with the Iranians. Uh, it just had a summit in March, hardly any, nobody showed up of the Arabs on the, on, on top of the, the summit leaders uh, level I'm talking about. And so they have to decide in Syria, essentially, um, what is the future of their country? Uh, my understanding of their economic situation is that for the first time they're about to be a net importer of oil. They're running out of oil and they're going to be more and more dependent on Iran. And I guess the Syrian foreign minister, Walid Mualim, who's known as an advocate of the peace approach, would say, you know, we don't try this other way. Uh, we're going to be a proxy of the Iranians, and there'll be nothing less, we'll, we will not be an independent country. So I tend to think that um, they've got a big decision to make, and they need, someone has got to make them an offer. There has to be a conversation. This administration isn't willing to do it. We can get into why that is. Uh, but without passing judgments here or there, I think this is a classic 2009 issue that will not be settled this year. 2008, there's tactical reasons for everybody to engage. Everybody's mired in some problem. Omer, Assad, the Turks. It's convenient. It's good. But we shouldn't exaggerate it, in my view. Uh, for this talks to come to fruition, and by the way, I hope it does, um, I tend to believe this will have to wait uh, for the coming year in a new administration. The final point I'll make is, and where I guess you'll see some sparks between uh, Rami and myself, but friendly sparks, because I, like I said, based on mutual respect, I feel, um, again, uh, respectfully, I, I tend to think that uh, 
Rami is more of a romantic view of, of, the, of the, the resurgence of the Islamist uh, factor. Um, you know, there's a, a real Islamist agenda when it comes to Hezbollah and Hamas. And in my view, that was the missing piece here. I don't see these, con these groups of Hezbollah and Hamas as um, groups that are, you know, b trying ultimately to, you know, be part of a democratic polity, but really want to advance their own ideological interests. And to me, the test if they really were wanting to be part of that democratic polity would be, as I think it was Weber said, you know, uh, does the state have the monopoly on the use of force? And uh, Hezbollah went to war in 2006 without even consulting the Lebanese government. You know, Rami will say, no, come on, they're part of the, uh, Hezbollah is part of the uh, Lebanese government. Look what's going on now. Of course, they want the economic benefits of, of Iran, of uh, Lebanon, but they don't want to be bound by Lebanese decision making. They want their own telecommunications network, which was Iranian, and they want their own that the security chief of the, the, the Beirut airport is a Hezbollah sympathizer. And if you don't believe me, listen to what uh, Tufeli, Sheikh Tufeli, the former head of Hezbollah, said just recently in, a, in an interview with a Kuwaiti paper. He says, unfortunately, the problem has developed today to the point where they've successfully succeeded in changing Hezbollah from a resistance tool into a tool to be used in the direction what they want, referring to Iran. He said, yes, Hezbollah is a tool and it's an integral part of the Iranian intelligence apparatus. Iran is the main nerve in the activity today in Lebanon. All Hezbollah activity is financed by Iranian funds. Syria has an important role, but Iran is the main and primary support uh, of Hezbollah. So I don't see it in such romantic terms. And uh, I can say the same about Khalid Mashal and Hamas. After I met Jimmy Carter, within two hours, because Jimmy Carter came to King David Hotel in Jerusalem and said, I just met Mashal. And by the way, I speak respectfully about Jimmy Carter. I think the guy you know, it was critical uh, in making peace between Israelis and Egyptians in the late 70s. Um, I think actually Sadat started on his initiative because he didn't like where Carter was heading, but that's a separate point. So I say this out of respect, but I think that this initiative with Hamas and believing you can engage them, uh, Mashal made it clear that, you know, this will never happen. We will never recognize Israel. This is not digging up the Hamas charter from the 1980s. This is Hamas in May 2008. So in my view, um, a ceasefire might be useful for all sides. And if it could lower tensions, and if, you know, if it could avoid bloodshed, I think it's great. But I, I don't see these groups, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, which are different, and I'm not here to lump everything together, but by them maintaining their arms, they want always the chance to opt out of any system. Uh, Hezbollah, for example, uh, you know, all the other groups in Lebanon disarmed, except Hezbollah. So these groups have a strong ideological agenda that they are trying to pursue, and I think we have to see it as such. Can there be tactical uh, uh, understandings with them? Can they broaden it? You know, maybe. But I think that we have to go into this uh, very much with our eyes open. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Aaron? Thanks. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time left, so I'm going to be brief because I, I, we really do want to hear from you. Hala, thank you for hosting this. You're really quite extraordinary. Um, and, and Rami and David, thanks for coming. Um, I'm not going to break the rules, but I, I want to uh, make a comment or two about the next six months and then talk about a few changes in what I would call the software that are going to be important for the next administration if, if in effect, we, we're ever going to get into a position where we can play an effective role. I'm less concerned, frankly, about the Arabs and the Israelis these days, with all due respect, and much more concerned about um, America. Because for the last 16 years, eight under Bill Clinton, in which we stumbled and failed at Arab-Israeli peacemaking, and eight years under George W. Bush, in which we failed galactically about how to make war, um, America is neither feared or respected, um, probably liked more than we would um, care to admit in this region, but we're not feared and respected in a region of the world that is increasingly critical to our national security interests. And the real threat to America will not come from a, dis a um, competitive China or an economically powerful and united Europe. It's going to come from an angry, humiliated, conflict-ridden, and dysfunctional. Uh, Arab and Muslim world that is seething and boiling. Um, and we have to understand that. 
Uh, I do not expect much in the next six months. I, I give the Secretary of State an enormous amount of credit. Um, better late than never. It's hard to do anything with respect to Arab-Israeli peacemaking. Little agreements, medium-sized agreements, big agreements, it's all excruciatingly painful. And if she can achieve anything, it would be uh, important. I think at, at a minimum, the Bush administration should adopt what I call the diplomatic equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath, which is essentially to do no harm and above all, above all to avoid failure. Above all to avoid failure. Because I am, the older I get, the more I'm persuaded that the most compelling ideology in life is not capitalism, it's not democracy, it's not nationalism, it's success. Because success generates real power and constituents, and we're failing. We really are failing. And we can't afford to continue uh, to fail. There are three pieces of the Arab-Israeli peacemaking process. There are three fragile pieces. The first is Omerd and Abbas. Is it a discussion channel or is it a decision-making channel? Nobody knows the answer to that. I tend to agree with David that there is more rather than less going on, whether or not this can be consummated in some sort of piece of paper. And I, I quote Samuel Goldwyn, Goldwyn in my, the Hollywood movie mogul in my book, an oral agreement isn't worth the paper it's written on. Well, the reality is we don't, we've never had a piece of paper. In 16 years of, of, of American efforts to create an understanding on permanent status, we've never had a piece of paper by an empowered, however constrained and weak, Israeli Prime Minister or Palestinian President. So a piece of paper that is complete and not partial, it seemed to me, even if it was general in its understandings, would be an advance. Um, I have no idea, frankly, whether or not that's possible. I, I tend to doubt it. The second piece is the um, very much needed Israeli Hamas informal accommodation brokered by the Egyptians. I'm not sure there's much the Bush administration can do to keep this alive. I think it's absolutely essential that it be kept alive. I think it will make it very easy for the next administration to walk away if in January of 2009, and believe me, they will walk away. They will walk away as quickly as the Bush administration walked away from the bad hand they inherited from the Clinton administration, a full-scale war between Israelis and Palestinians, and Arafat and Sharon. Um, a young and untested Democratic president, a more veteran Republican president with other things to do in the Middle East, the Arab-Israeli peace process because presidents don't want to fail early in any administration. If it doesn't look like there's something positive that can come out of it, they will not engage in any serious way. They could try to manage, but it will not be serious and will not work. So it's critical that these two pieces, Abbas and Omer and the ceasefire continue. The Israeli-Syrian negotiations, does it, does it matter? The reality is that it cannot succeed, in my judgment, without a third party who's capable of brokering the excruciatingly painful bridges to the gaps that remain and providing the economic and the deployment of American forces, which will be required. Both the elder Assad uh, and even Shamir in the early 90s and Rabin and Barak and Assad again were intrigued by our willingness to uh, <coughs> provide a security guarantee on the Golan Heights, including the deployment of American forces. No one else for a variety of reasons that pertain to our relationship with the Israelis, can substitute for that. Not the Turks, not the Brits, not the UN, nobody except us. So it could happen in 09 um, under certain set of circumstances. So let me just conclude with four or five points. We need a change in software about the way we deal with this entire region, it seems to me. Before we get to the hardware, which are the policies, we need to look at the region and what, how we are perceived and what we do in a different way. Number one, we have to make it, we have to decide whether or not we care about this. Do we care about it or don't we? Because if, if an American president doesn't make it a top priority and doesn't persuade both his own bureaucracy, the Congress, and our adversaries and friends out there that we care about it, no one will take us seriously. And that means a relationship between the President of the United States and the next Secretary of State. And I despair when I think about this, because I don't see how this is going to work. I don't see a Secretary of State on the horizon who is tough enough, devious enough, and close enough, I mean this seriously, close enough to the next president to play that role. 
you need a you need a Kissinger or a Baker to do to do this, and I'm not sure there is such a, a partnership with an ex-president out there. But regardless, we've got to demonstrate that we care about it. Number two, this can't be a policy for four years or eight years. We are in an investment trap in this region. We can't fix it, and we can't extricate ourselves from it. And we have to start thinking, not in, in the way I measured my life for 25 years in terms of administrations. We have to think beyond that. And that's going to be very hard, given the four to eight year cycles in which the bits and pieces of American policy are actually made. Three, we have two dysfunctional relationships. They both emerged at the same time. The first book I ever wrote was on one of those dysfunctional relationships, and that is the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. But we have another dysfunctional relationship, and that is the other special relationship that emerged roughly during the 1940s, and that's with the Israelis. These are both dysfunctional, and they've stripped American tactical and strategic flexibility away. And let me make it very clear. I'm not suggesting we abandon these relationships. I'm not suggesting we um, sacrifice Israel's security uh, or a commitment to Israel, but we have allowed these special relationships, particularly on the Israeli side, to become exclusive. <laughs> We've allowed the special relationship to become exclusive. That is bad. It is bad. We, 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 we've, we cannot say no to bad Israeli ideas. Um, we allow what, far too much latitude uh, in terms of Israeli interests taking priorities over our interests. And we're not willing to be tough enough privately or publicly when we see and identify situations that the Israelis don't like and I, uh, that, that, that undermine our interests. And I don't, this is not an issue, it is an issue of domestic politics. But it, it, it doesn't have to be, because for the last 60 years, no American president or secretary of state should feel defensive or embarrassed about the nature of our commitment to the state of Israel. As far as I'm concerned, the debate in America between the supporters and detractors of Israel is over. It's over. It's finished. And the pro-Israeli community, in my judgment, has won and one in a very important way. It is an American interest that we support a sovereign state of Israel. It is, for a variety of reasons. But we've allowed it, that commitment, to essentially undermine our interests. And it, it, it makes no sense. That's the, third, that's the third piece of software that has to be changed. And, and same with the Saudi relationship, which is broken down. The oil for security trade-off is no longer functional. And our growing dependence on hydrocarbons, which is a long-term issue, is obviously something that requires an enormous amount of work. Um, I'll close with one, one other point. If I were to identify two things that need to change in the minds of the next president, it would be, and, I, and they may sound silly, number one is study the past. I mean. A.J.P. Taylor, the great British historian, was right. You know, the only lesson of history is that there are no lessons. But if you ignore it all, history is a cruel and unforgiving teacher. And the trillion dollars, what my, what my colleague Bob Litwock calls the trillion dollar social science project or experiment <clears throat> that is now Iraq, in part resulted from an inability, unwillingness to understand the past and how others have tried to cope. And second, the most important thing, see the world the way it is, not the way we want it to be. And I would argue to you, if we could only do two, those two things, we'd have a chance in the next administration of getting in the game. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going, uh, I'm going to take now questions both from here and also from the overflow, and then at the end I'll give you each five minutes to sort of answer each other. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, and can you wait for the mic also and identify yourself? Okay, Stanley Kober with the Cato Institute. I want to pick up something that Aaron said about the Region C thing and direct the question to Mr. Khoury. Um there is a lot of talk, I'm sure you're aware, of a possible attack on Iran. 
either by us or the Israelis. And I go to a lot of meetings and people say, it will blow over, there won't be much of a reaction. You know, a couple days maybe. But I hear Aaron, as I said, talking about seething. At what point do you think the seething, that's this bubbling of anger in the region, blows up? Would that be enough to blow it up? Well, I, I wouldn't um, make it so categorical. I think what you've seen is the anger in the region already expressing itself. That's the point I was trying to make, that the real change happened uh, after the Cold War, not after 9-11, uh, when you had a real powerful re revival, a resurgence of indigenous identities and movements and political forces, and people gradually coming together all over the region in different kinds of groups, tribal groups, Islamist groups, democracy groups, ca global capitalist groups, um, um, state-centered nationalist groups, all kinds of different groups, people started being much more empowered. As the whole region kind of opened up a little bit at the end of the Cold War, partly for economic stress, partly because the Cold War support uh, was dissipating in many situations, you started to get power being exercised by other groups in society, other than the state, and um, David mentioned the uh, idea that uh, who you know, the, if the state doesn't control the military power, um, then you have a new political situation. Well, this is exactly what's happened. Um, power is dissipated now all over the Middle East in economic terms, political terms, military terms, uh, religious, social identity terms, information terms. All the fundamental attributes of power are no longer centrally controlled by states as they had been from the 1940s till the 19. Uh, 90s. Um, so we've seen the expression of, uh, it's not just anger, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a corrosive sense of uh, dysfunctional statehood is what we've had in this region, combined with humility, anger, disappointment, vulnerability, all the bad things that you can think about have happened, and people won't sit the, the, the single biggest change, I repeat it again, is people will not sit around in most of the Middle East. They will not sit around and watch their own marginalization and vulnerability on CNN and Jazeera. They won't be passive, acquiescent, docile uh, observers of their own um, um, uh, marginalization um, and this is, the change has already happened. Um, the, the, the single most powerful example of this is the Shiites of Lebanon. And this is where I disagree with, with David. I think if there is one consistent strand in the American perception of the Middle East, it has been the chronic, continuous, and increasing um, misdiagnosis by the government, by think tanks, by some academics, by the media, a, a chronic, sustained misdiagnosis, misunderstanding of what these Islamist groups represent, but not just the Islamist groups, because what's going on with the Islamists is going on with tribal groups, with uh, other ideological groups. So I think the, the power, the nature of changing power and identity in the Middle East uh, is the big story. And the, uh, what the Shiites of Lebanon did before the Iranian Revolution, this is not about Iran. To, to see Iran behind all of these groups is a fundamental misunderstanding of what these groups represent. The Shiite revival in Lebanon started in the late 1960s, a decade before the Iranian Revolution. Um, and what you're seeing spread all over the region is a much wider example of people taking command of their own destinies and, and trying to fight for their rights. Now, what, what they want, how do you deal with them, what, will they, what do they really represent? These are political issues that people have to uh, work on. So I think we've seen the change already, and you can be sure that an attack on Iran will elicit a very strong response from Iran, from Iran's allies and strategic partners, and from other people uh, throughout the region. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, it's a possibility. I mean, I don't think anyone would want the Shia of uh, Lebanon to be disadvantaged. Uh, I don't think that's what is, is driving Nasrallah, and that's why I, I quoted Tofeli, who was the head of Hezbollah. So, uh, but to get to that question, I, you know, when I saw this article in the New York Times of Israeli uh, planes overflying the Mediterranean, and, uh, you know, to get back to what I started with, you know, that twilight zone between November and January, it might be convenient to say, well, that's where we're heading now, aren't we? That uh, 
Israel is going to try to attack Iran during that period and hopefully coordinate it with Bush, who's leaving office, believing that 2009 is the year of dialogue. And they, the Israelis are very skeptical that Iran is going to give up their nuclear weapons, no matter who's president of the United States. And believing that even McCain is a president, that he would go for dialogue too, because you can't go from confrontation to confrontation. I don't think the Israelis would would want to attack. Uh, and uh, I I saw their um, their uh, exercises as more a signal to the Europeans, uh, as a way of trying to say, hey, you know, Israel is serious, and uh, you know, you tried all these carrots. Uh, through uh, the the EU three etc. Now uh, you need to ratchet up uh, that sort of economic pressure because uh, right now Iran is thumbing its nose and uh, this is the alternative is a military strike. But I don't think they're you know they're thirsty for a strike at all. I I tend to think they would like this uh, to be resolved peacefully. Uh, and it was interesting that the EU just on Friday just sanctioned uh, Iranian banks. Uh, led by Bank Mali, so the Israelis probably think that that was uh, that that was that that, that signal uh, was um, sent and received. Yeah. Thank you. I have a two finger, then I'll come here. Barbara, okay. you want to add? Something? Sure. Um, Just wait okay. for the mic. Uh, Barbara Slavin and identify. Barbara Slavin from USIP. The two finger is about Sheikh Tufeli. He is, you know, he's. He was pushed aside by Nasrallah, and he hates him. So I would not quote him as an unbiased source on Iranian involvement with Hezbollah. That's all. And if I can add another two fingers, that especially being quoted by a Kuwaiti newspaper. So I think <laughs> the, the you know, you can, you my respect to some Kuwaiti newspapers, but the combination of the two is pretty deadly. <laughs> well, um, yes, please. Just could you wait for the mic? And then uh, we move here. Hello there, I'm Seth Brown, uh, American Task Force on Palestine. Um, you've we talked about the, the future of peace, and we've been very you know critical of the United States, very critical, especially David of, uh, of Hamas in Gaza, um, having been exiled there by the Europeans, the Americans, and the Israelis after the election that we we didn't really appreciate the result of. But isn't it also the case um, that the future of peace? is in Israeli hands. They are quite literally the ones standing at all of the doors, holding all of the keys, the ones building settlements, the ones building the wall, um, the ones blocking trade to Gaza. Uh, they're the ones that are eventually going to have to remove settlers. They're the ones that are eventually going to have to pull down the wall. They're the ones, uh, if peace is to come about. So isn't there some sort of, can't we have a bit more of a, uh, a balanced perspective as much uh, to criticize Israel equally as the US and the uh, the Palestinians? Look, I would say here, the Israelis wanted to end this conflict in the year 2000. This is not, you know, due respect, I disagree that this issue is about land. It's, it's an issue of the Israelis just want to know if they, give the land that they get peace. And right now they feel they got out of Gaza and they got rockets. So if there's a way to make the equation land for peace and not land for rockets, I think they would grab it. But the fact that they went through the painful thing, pulled up the settlers, got, you know, and that was not easy for them, that they did it, it, it the right, basically, that they see Hamas and the right wing of Israel is kind of working in tandem. That, that they're not working together in the sense that they are morally equivalent or anything like that. But that the right wing says, look, every time you get out, all you get is vulnerability. So you have to appreciate, you know, where they're located. That they would like to end this conflict. They don't get any enjoyment out of continued conflict. Any conflict is going to require dignity for both sides. But they just want to know that if they get out, they're safer than they are now. That's the only issue. It's not more, in my view, it's not more difficult than that. It comes down to a security equation. That's all. Uh, I don't you know, I, at, at the risk of adding further, you know, depression to this very grim session. I mean, I, no, no more illusions has to be the, the banner for, for Americans, Israelis, and Palestinians. It really does. 
because the time for illusions are past. Is there an Israeli-Palestinian deal? Yeah, there's an Israeli-Palestinian deal. Is there one that could end the conflict? Maybe. But it's going to require excruciatingly painful decisions from all three parties. And there's absolutely no way to treat this other than a conflict between an occupied nation on one hand and a threatened nation on the other. And this is something that is extremely difficult for many people to internalize and, and assimilate, it seems to me. The gaps on Jerusalem borders, refugees, and security, with all due respect to what Omer and Abbas are doing, are very large. They are very, very large. And they're large not just because of one side. They're large because any agreement that meets Israeli needs today on the four core issues will not be a good agreement for Palestinians. And any agreement that meets Palestinian needs will not be a good agreement for Israelis. And this is a sober judgment, but it reflects much more of a reality than the notion that there is a single key to, this, to opening up this door. There really isn't a single key. And we, as Americans, have to understand this. I don't believe, in, I don't believe we've even been close to negotiating a conflict-ending agreement between Israelis and Palestinians. And the, the bulk of the responsibilities, um, whether they lie symmetrically or not, isn't the point. Both sides really are responsible for the perpetuation of this conflict. Both sides need to make excruciatingly difficult choices if the conflict's going to be resolved. Uh, Amal, Amal. Yes, uh, Amal advisor to Mr. Saad Hariri. I'm going to do something I don't like, which is basically disagree with Rami, and I enjoy Rami's articles a lot. Uh, I really disagree, Rami, that uh, the problem in Lebanon now is about Shia power and Shia uh, revival. Shia revival maybe might have been true in the 60s. I think this is an old story now, and you know more than anybody else. The problem now in Lebanon is not that the Shias don't have rights. The problem in Lebanon now is that probably uh, they don't accept the right of the state to say, to, to wage war and peace, uh, to take decisions, and everybody knows in this room that we've been blocked for a year, uh, we couldn't do anything because the Shia uh, speaker of the House closed the parliament. Closed the parliament. So I, I think saying that it's about Shia power, I think it's a little bit uh, outdated because mm -hmm. now they have too much power, including weapons that are pushing others to start uh, thinking about arming in the country. So, so I really wanted to clarify that, and I don't think you see anybody now in Lebanon who will say the problem now is about Shia power. Oh. It's about, I think the problem now is they have too much power and people feel that they are pushing them. My quick, I'm sorry, my quick <laughs> question is, we are running if, yeah, sorry, the uh, exchange of prisoners with Hezbollah that's going to take place, they say, maybe on the 12th. Can anybody explain to me why Israel refused to have this exchange in 2006? They could have saved Lebanon, destroying Lebanese state and Lebanon, and they could have saved lots of blood and uh, and agony for everybody, especially for, for Lebanon. Why now? Why not 2006? And why giving it to Hezbollah and not giving it to the state? Um, I will ask uh, both uh, Rami and David to be very Short, brief. Exactly. And uh, uh, yes, I have everybody's name down <laughs> and some, but I have to just squeeze it. Yeah, very uh, brief I, I agree, Amal. You're absolutely right. I didn't mean to say that the problem now is Shiite power. The problem now is that you have this um, enormous group, Hezbollah, which is stronger than the state in many cases. And there's a big problem with the chronic, and, and what did it, when I talked about the configuration of statehood, the, the, the whole process of political sovereignty in Lebanon and the balance of power, sharing power, is completely up in the air. And these are traumatized communities, especially the Christian community, which is, which is split, and uh, the Muslims are more than the Christians, and the Shiites are the biggest group, and Iran and Syria, and there's all these tremendous chronic structural problems in Lebanon which I think the Lebanese can solve. Uh, but the, the, what I meant by Shiite re reassertion is that, th that what, what Hezbollah, what the Shiites did in Lebanon is now being done at a regional scale in terms of people who had been vulnerable and marginalized 
becoming stronger and taking control of their lives. That's what I meant. Um, in, in Lebanon, the problem clearly is much uh, stronger. But you'd have in Lebanon a microcosm of the whole region, which is these two groups that I mentioned, more or less equally balanced. The, the March 14 and the March 8 are more or less equally balanced in the, in the population with external support, internal support, legitimacy in the government, and they fought to a stalemate. So they have to figure out a way to actually have more coherent governance in Lebanon, which I think they will do, but it's going to take uh, now problem. It'll be much more difficult because they have to. It, the problems are linked to regional problems as well. Uh, I I agree with you that if they could make the exchange with the government of Lebanon, this would be much better. Uh, I don't think, from my understanding, Hezbollah was willing to give the bodies of uh, El Dad and Gold uh, Regev and Goldwasser to the government. Um, so I think that's why it seems to me it isn't happening. Why now? Um, you know, I get back to my remarks, which is, and this is speculation, that I wonder if Israel is trying to cool off a variety of fronts because it wants the focus either on a, a diplomatic breakthrough w w in the West Bank or it wants to focus all of the energies on Iran right now. I'm going to take two questions at the same time. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, please. Take it to uh, Ahmed East, uh, particularly aimed at David. As I understood, <clears throat> the U.S.-Israeli strategy, to the extent there was one after Hamas was legally elected uh, as the ruling party, was that we were going to isolate and marginalize Hamas, and we would shower Mahmoud Abbas and Fayyad with uh, favors and good things, and so everybody would see look how much better life is on the West Bank with those moderate Palestinians than in Gaza with the radicals. And as far as Hamas goes, I mean, Sharon had the option of negotiating with the, the PA, his, leaving Gaza. He chose very clearly to say, I don't have a partner and just do it unilaterally. Uh, so it's to me, this is somewhat analogous to what happened in Lebanon when Israel overstayed by years it's what would have been its welcome by the Shia in South Lebanon. And so you got a much more radical Hezbollah than you might have otherwise had, and you have a much more radicalized Gazan population than you otherwise would have. So my question is, how can Israel's leaders, you know, how can they look at this situation and continue to go on with settlement activity, uh, checkpoints that are really meant to protect settlers, not the people behind the wall? Uh, and expect that Abbas and Salam Fayyad are going to be able to rally any support for peace. Um, let's take another yeah, question. Sure. To, yes, here, Senator, and then we'll take My name is Stephen Jor. My question is, given the, arraign, the Israeli political system, is it at all conceivable that any government could emerge strong enough to sign a deal even with a willing partner? Or must the Israeli political system be changed so that one, uh, you could get a single party with a solid majority in the Knesset before a peace is signed. Uh, let's take the last one last here. The lady too. Uh, can you give us your card? And then you have the final one. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Teresa Kao with CPAC. And uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to indicate that there is, I believe, a win-win uh, tipping point solution for the Middle East crisis. Uh, first of all, if um, if, our, if America and the nations can't leave uh, Israel and the other nations alone to decide for themselves their security, I believe that it is critical that the U.S. foreign policy as well as um, question, please world answer, policy, yeah. yes, this is yeah. the question, question. that um, it is critical that uh, American policy and world policy must support Israel in, in terms of defense of their land and their security because what we do to imperil Israel directly imperils us as a nation. And, and this is all, all um, indicated. Are you familiar with this book called As America Has Done to Israel? And literally, our nation is directly imperiled. Okay, and then that because of the present day, I'm, I'm almost done, sir. And because, Please. one moment, sir. Thank Please. you. Please. And then the thirdly, are you familiar um, with uh, the present day uh, flight plan that is proposed by Senator uh, Sam Brambach as well as Dave Walden, which actually is key in promoting um, the Palestinian Arabs who are the refugees with 
freedom of assembly, speech, religion, press, and politics, and economic development instead of pursuing a terrorist mini state. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, I will have all three panelists take all these uh, questions, and this would be also their final comment. David? Okay. Thanks, Hala. Uh, on the electoral system question, it's, yes, that's what should happen. It should, they should change their system. But given the history, I don't expect them to. Uh, if they, you know, Aaron will tell you about how many Israeli governments there have been. They basically have enough for one initiative. I don't know exactly 1.9 years per government because it depends how you average out. But whatever it is, the point is, is that uh, Israel's electoral system um, creates a, a kind of a fragmented uh, power system that needs reform. But I don't believe it will happen uh, the way it should. And at best, you'll see incremental, very incremental moves like raising the threshold in the Knesset, things like that but not significant. Now, to get to Ted's uh, question about uh, unilateralism and, uh, and the like, and do you have this like, kind of West Berlin, East Berlin system where you have these two entities that are ideologically and geographically distinct? Um, look, I share with you the 2005 mistake. I, I said this to Israelis in 2003, uh, right at the time of Sharon's speech at Herzliya. Uh, I said, you can't just uh, take the keys and throw them over the fence. You're, you're going to have to work it out. And, you know, they'll, they'll, they could show you 25 different meetings they had with Abbas, which, which didn't work. Uh, so I, don't blame, I can't blame all of Israel. I think 2005, if, if, to get back to the theme of our event today, this for me was the chance for the Bush administration. I think it made two big mistakes in, in 2005. Um, the first term, I see why it didn't want to work with Arafat. Didn't see him as a partner. Yelling jihad in the middle of intifadas does cause problems. And there were a lot of uh, killings as a result. But 2005 was the chance, in my view. And we're living in the shadow of 2005. Uh, the two mistakes were, in my view, not having the United States step up to the plate and use the, the great hand it was played, where you had a new leader, Abbas wins with 62% of the vote, and you have Ariel Sharon who wants to pull out settlers. That was the moment for the Bush administration. And I fear, I'm sorry, I say this out of sadness, uh, I think that moment was missed. And the second mistake, in my view, was uh, equating democracy uh, with, with an election and not having a broader definition. Um, and uh, where you, know, you say it's either bullets or ballots, parties or militias, but you, know, you don't do both. And I feel that that brought us Hamas. So those were the two mistakes. We live in the shadow of, of 2005 here in 2008. Um, so I think you know, unilateralism, it could have been done differently if you would have had a commitment of uh, Abbas, uh, Bush, and, and, and then Sharon at that time. Uh, the Israelis will say today, you know, uh, the Palestinians, I was just in Ramallah last month. I don't, I want to leave people just with a little bit of an up uplift a little bit. Uh, I don't mean to make the say that the cup is half full, um, but uh, there's something there. Um, the, um, I just zipped around the West Bank and I had Palestinian drivers, and I must say, everywhere I went there was abandoned checkpoints. Uh, when there's been a reduction in, in suicide bombers, there's been a reduction in checkpoints, but you, you don't read about it in the media, but that was my experience. Uh, by the way, I'll add little things, you know, it's nice that the, the Ramallah, you know, the Palestinian stock market is up 36 points uh, this year and that what double parts? the number of tourists in the West Bank. <laughs> but these are small points, but I think that there's a leadership on the Palestinian side that's connected. If I could say one last word on settlements, and I'm not here to defend a single settlement, um, but I think that there needs to be some, there's a real misconnect, and I, I feel I'm against settlement expansion because I think it sends the wrong signal. But the Israelis will say they're building settlements in areas that will be Israeli. And, and that they're offsetting settlement blocks that could give the Palestinians 100% of the land. But the Palestinians will say, yeah, but uh, a Palestinian doesn't walk around with a map and doesn't know where those necessarily where those blocks are and where the offsetting swap areas will be. So uh, each side is, is not connecting with the other one. And, um, and I feel that this is part of the problem. And because of the, the amount of miscommunication that's possible, it's preferable not to do it, even though the Israelis don't see it as provocative as, as others see it. 
Um, but that's, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Rami? Um, well, there's so many things to talk about, not much time, but just a, a couple of quick points. Um, I think um, we have to decide, are, is this a conflict between two people with equal rights? Or is the, is the criterion and the um, litmus test for people being taken as a political partners the fact that they have to first guarantee Israel's security. If Israel's security is the ticket for our own validity as Palestinians, the answer is thanks but no thanks. I mean, that's the lesson from the Palestinian people. You can't solve a problem by asking that one side be guaranteed its core demands and then the other people will perhaps get what they want. You can't do that. You have to start on the basis of international law, political morality, and human decency. And I think the point that the, the Arabs have been making uh, is that we are prepared to coexist with an Israeli Jewish state. We weren't prepared to do that 30 years ago. We are prepared to do it today. But we're prepared to do this conditionally, on the condition that we and the Israelis are seen to be people who have equal rights in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the law, and in the eyes of each other. If we accept that basic starting point, then all of these problems can be resolved. And I think they can. I'm somebody who has always thought that this is a problem, a conflict that can be negotiated. But it can't be negotiated on the basis of saying that Israel did a tough thing by getting out of Gaza. Compliance with the law is always tough. So getting out of Gaza was the thing to do because it was the right thing to do, it was the legal thing to do. And if Israel talks about international law, its right to exist, democracy, the rule of law as being defining characteristics of the modern state of Israel or the Jewish ethos, then it presumably has to abide by the rule of law as well as asking others to abide by it. So the missed opportunities were also the election of Hamas, the national unity government uh, with Fatah, and today we have another opportunity, so let's not miss this one, the ceasefire in Gaza. This is an extraordinary opportunity, and this is where I agree with um, Aaron that the, the U.S. should do no harm. Just leave the situation like it is, pass it on to the next administration, let more reasonable people take advantage of the opportunity that we have with the ceasefire to actually start engaging both sides on the basis of equal rights, Israeli security, Palestinian security, equal rights simultaneously and mutually applied, not sequentially or conditionally one on the other. So I tend still to be positive, but the point I'm making, I'll finish with this, is that the vast majority, a majority of people in the Middle East, 300 million or so people, have now basically said they will not play by the old rules of the game. And the fundamental misunderstanding in Washington, in Israel, and increasingly in Europe, is they don't understand what is the significance of Hamas or Hezbollah or Muslim Brothers or other people. They just, the people are not able to understand it because they're not seeing it through the mutual and simultaneous and equal rights of both sides. They're seeing it through the prism of Israeli security. And this is, this is a, 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 a recipe for perpetual uh, conflict. So I think there is good news. I, and I said the Israelis are acting much more sensibly than the American government, which is, a, which is a good sign. And the majority of Israelis in public opinion polls also express a basic amount of decency and credibility and, and rationality, which is not a surprise because we know they're decent, rational, credible people. Uh, as are the people in the Arab world. So I think what you need is just better leaderships to overcome the uh, tradition of, uh, of nincompoopery that we've had with so many of the leaders in the United States and Israel and, and the Arab world. Thank you. What? Aaron, you have the last one. We have yeah. time for one Sorry? additional comment. Yeah, please. Um, I'll, I'll close on a personal note. Um, not directed at Israelis and Palestinians. I assume, or Israelis and Syrians, I assume, because history, is instructive here that unless the, the raw material in the region exists, then then the United States will not be able to move in, in, in an effective way. I take that as a given. I think there is raw material there, um, but I'll close by saying this. There are three propositions that are critical to getting it right for America. Number one, believing that there's an equitable and durable solution to this conflict an equitable and a durable solution, one based not on a balance of imbalance or balance of power necessarily, but a balance of interest. That's the first issue, and we've lost faith in that. Second, that negotiations, perhaps preceded by insurgency and violence, but negotiations are the only way 
but they have to be credible and serious negotiations. And I think we've lost sight of that. And finally, that America, despite all of its imperfections and loss of credibility, um, can play and must play a critical role. Now, I think all these three propositions over the last eight years, and I would argue, with all due respect to my colleagues in the Clinton administration, we didn't get it right. We, including me, didn't get it right then either. But we've got to recapture these three basic propositions. Whether or not the next president will, in fact, choose, and governing is about choosing your priorities. That's what it means to govern in Washington. You decide what you care about, what's important. I don't know the answer to that. But at a, but at a minimum, we've got to regain and re-energize those three basic elements. And if we do, we may just have a chance to get in the game and actually do something serious. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to.